Okay, um, I'm here to uh, introduce Dr. Colin Wright, and he's going to speak to us about what is a woman, debunking myths about the biology of sex. So Dr. Wright has a PhD in evolutionary biology. He is the founder of Reality's Last Stand, which explores the debate around sex and gender. Without further ado, thank you, Dr. Wright. Awesome. Well, thanks for the invite. This is an amazing event. I'm having a great time. I've met so many amazing people. Um, I think a lot of what the previous speakers did that was really great is look at how, uh, I guess I would just best describe them as a lot of activists that are trying to just diminish sex differences between male and female. But I think there's, you know, there's actually a more insidious thing going on because once we've actually presented all the evidence that I would consider what you guys just saw was pretty irrefutable about these sex differences, the narrative sort of shifts and the data doesn't matter, it's still inclusion. Um, so there's something else going on that's not so much that they just are waiting for the data because as Ross has, uh, has said, the data is clearly in. Um, there's not so much this attempt to, I guess, blur the lines between performance between males and females or sex differences, but there's actually like a more fundamental attempt to just blur the lines between what males and female are completely. You know, there's a lot of people that will say things, um, you know, that sex is a spectrum, or that there's multiple sexes or something like this, or you know, more than two. Um, or that sex is just a complete social construct and, uh, you know, we can't even talk about males, we can just talk about sort of degrees of maleness and femaleness. So that's kind of what I want to talk about more. I'll get to like the what is a woman thing at the end and I understand that's kind of weird as a guy standing up here for a room full of mostly women explaining what you are. So that'll be a very brief thing at the very end. Um, but mostly I'm gonna just go through a couple arguments that people are, uh, well, a lot of motivated activists are using to really try to just undermine the concept of biological sex altogether. Not just saying that the differences aren't that big, but that these aren't even real things. And that's sort of what's, I think, underlying a lot of the, uh, the arguments that we're seeing. It's why when you give them the data that there's big sex differences, that doesn't seem to matter all of a sudden, okay? So we'll start out first with just like an overview of sexual reproduction, okay? So sexual reproduction, it's a type of reproduction that involves a complex life cycle in which, uh, in which a gamete such as sperm or an egg cell within a, with a single set of chromosomes combines with another to produce a zygote that develops into an organism composed of cells with two sets of chromosomes. So that's just a long way of saying that you have uh, males and females and some plants this can be in the same organism, some animals too, but there's a lot of, you know, if we're talking about humans, these are two separate organisms. Um, from the male testes or the uh, female ovaries, they'll produce either egg or sperm. These then become, they, through fertilization, they come, uh, these two, you know, half of a component of chromosomes come together to form a complete one in a zygote. This then turns into an embryo, continues to develop into a fetus, and then eventually you get a new organism. Uh, that This then grows up and continues this life cycle contributing either sperm or ova into the next generation. So um, this is what we mean by sexual reproduction. You can't talk about what sex is without understanding sort of this is what it's, it's, it's doing. This is an ancient process, um, been around for many hundreds of millions of years. Um, so what are males and females? We've talked a lot about that today. I'll just go over it again kind of briefly. So it does involve something to do with eggs and sperm uh, or gametes as, as you've learned. Um, so broadly speaking, if we just sort of back up and take a, take a, a distance look at it, um, males are the sex that produce small gametes or sperm, and females produce large gametes or ova. Now I can already hear like the activists yelling, you know, but not all humans produce sperm or ova. You know, this is what you'll commonly encounter, you know, and yeah, so <laughs> while this is how sex is defined in a broad sense, it's, it's crucial to note that the sex of, you know, individuals within a species isn't necessarily based on if an individual can actually produce uh, certain gametes at any given moment. We have, you know, pre-pubertal pu uh, pre males, for instance, they're not actively producing sperm. Um, and, you know, people with a variety of, of sexual development issues might not ever be fertile, okay? But we can still, you know, we can say a male is still a male even before puberty, they're not actively producing sperm. Um, so if we want to actually, like, sex the, an individual, like a flesh and blood individual, what we're really looking at is, um, well, sex of an individual is based on their reproductive anatomy, 
And it's defined by the type of the gamete this anatomy is organized around through development to produce, whether that ever becomes the case, whether they ever actually can ever make it, or they used to be able to make gametes and didn't before. It's just really sort of the, the ground plan, the organizational plan of their reproductive anatomy. Okay, so um, because there is no third or intermediate gamete, uh, you know, people talk about the elusive spurg or speg sometimes. Um, people are still looking for those. Uh, <laughs> there's th therefore no third type of anatomy that can develop to produce it, and therefore there's only two sexes in humans, and this means that sex is a binary system, okay? Um, this, this should be the end of my talk, really, <laughs> but <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of people seem to have a problem with this, and the next part of my talk is going to talk about all the various issues that people seem to have with this very straightforwardly laid out thing I just I told you about, what males and females are. I can't believe I'm actually having to give a talk like this. Um, <laughs> but here we go. So I'm going to debunk a few myths about the biology of sex. Um, so what myths are there? Well, uh, there were some that were brought up earlier. So one is this idea that sex is a spectrum. Sometimes they'll even say it's a social construct. Uh, we'll get into about what that means. And then there's other people that argue that there are more than two sexes, okay? So I'd actually be really interested in seeing these two different crowds talk to each other because these are not really compatible with each other to a large degree. The multiple sexes people, it's, it's really weird because I'm of the, I would say opinion, but I'm of the knowledge that there's only two sexes. People who say that there's three sexes, you know, make, they get a huge applause. Four sexes, great. 10 sexes, even better. Sex is a spectrum, there's an infinite number. Oh my God, this is amazing. Maybe there's two sexes, you're a bigot. This is sort of how it, how it uh, ends up playing out. So there's something about the number two that there seems to be uh, a lot of disdain for, which is a little interesting. Um, so let's get into the sex spectrum. So what are people saying here? Usually they just talk about, they don't really talk about males. I have male and female on here, but they would like to more talk about maleness and femaleness. Just we're all degrees of male and female. No one is really a male or a female. We're all intersex to some degree. You know, we can take maybe some measurements of different features and we can find out where along the sex spectrum where you reside. Um, in the middle, this is sort of the intersex area. But, you know, as I said, we're all kind of intersex to some degree according to this ideology. Uh, sometimes they'll try to give it like the patina of being scientific and they'll say it's a bimodal spectrum. It'll look something like this. Uh, where you have sort of these two maxima, these two areas where, you know, there's, there's sort of clumping. There's people who are mostly male and mostly female, um, but there's then this valley in the middle. This is like the intersex valley. Um, and this, this kind of appeals to our intuition, I guess, in our everyday of how we're looking at people. So it's, it's really enticing, and it kind of looks scientific because if people look at that, if you don't know much about biology, if you're, you're just looking at people every day, this is kind of, you know, it makes, it makes kind of sense. Um, but... Uh, I'm going to argue that these are both bad. I think actually the second one, the bimodal one, is actually worse, has more worse implications. So is this just something that's in, you know, fringe, you know, departments in the university or activist communities? It's just on Tumblr. Well, you know, that used to be the case, and a lot of people ignored it for a while. But this has kind of gone really mainstream. There's a highly sympathetic media environment that's really just allowing these things to just spread like wildfire, these ideas. So, you know, we have big, um, I guess, magazines, Scientific American. A lot of people have seen this sex spectrum diagram. Uh, Discover magazine, they say that you can tell from skeletal remains that sex is a spectrum. That's interesting. <laughs> then there's, you know, popular YouTube videos that say biological sex is a spectrum. Um, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of views on a lot of these videos. Uh, said very authoritatively, there's popular books that talk about the sex spectrum that claim to, you know, they're just really giving you the facts about how biology has completely changed over the last five years. Uh, despite, despite the fact that I've no Nobel Prizes have been, have been sent out for this discovery of the sex spectrum or the third sex or anything like that. Um, there's activist organizations, you know, they'll have their gender identity expression spectrum, they'll have, uh, you know, all these different spectrums they have, and then they'll include biological sex, that's right there on the top right there, just, again, that whole sex spectrum, um, which mean male, female, and inter intersex. There's New York Times, Ann Fosto Sterling has written articles why sex is not binary, so, it's, you know, it's a spectrum argument. Um, but, you know, is this really in major scientific journals now, like this, these aren't really big journals. Scientific American is a popular magazine. Well, unfortunately, 
it's all the way at the very top. You know, this is Nature. This is the most prestigious scientific journal in the world by, by quite a large margin. Um, and here they say that sex has been redefined. Uh, they say that um, the idea of two sexes is overly simplistic, and biologists now think that there is a uh, larger spectrum than just male or female. So um, this was news to me when I saw it come out. So this isn't just sort of academic musing. Many people say, well, what are the consequences of this? You know, there, there's actually a lot of problems that are arising from this denial of biological sex. A lot of them we talked about now. You know, this is an ideology that's not just saying that sex differences are small, but you know, sex is, is a spectrum. Who's really to say that Leah Thomas isn't actually a female if sex is a spectrum? Where do you really draw the line? Maybe we should just go based on how they identify. Okay, so the two main arguments for the sex spectrum. One is this argument from intersex conditions. So uh, because some individuals might have ambiguous genitalia to some degree, uh, therefore males and females, you can't really draw a line between them. We're all just varying degrees of maleness and femaleness. And then there's this argument from secondary sex characteristics. And these are all the features that you gain through puberty. So if you're a male, uh, you're gonna have a big major growth spurt, you get facial hair, your voice deepens. Uh, females, they, have, they, they develop breasts, they're, you know, the, the fat on their body distributes in certain ways that are different than males. Um, all, the, all the effects that happen to your body after puberty that sort of contribute to our, our uh, sexual dimorphism, basically. This is what we mean by secondary sex characteristics. So we'll first start with the intersex conditions and how this argument goes. So the intersex argument, they say uh, that sex cannot be binary if some individuals have sexual anatomy that appears to fall somewhere in between males and females. This is uh, most popularized by the Scientific American article that said, you know, viewing sex as a spectrum. And this is actually a needlessly complex image here. Like Emma has shown before that there's arrows that are drawn all over it that really don't need to be, they don't need to span the entire page. Um, but it's really, it's meant there, this, this is meant to stun you. It's meant to just make you feel like a deer in the headlights and then just throw your hands up and just say, tell me what to believe, basically. So this is, um, this is kind of what it's done and this is how it's used. I mean, if you're ever on the internet talking with people about it, this is something they're gonna throw in your face. Um, so if we wanna get a more accurate look of what this sex spectrum would look like um, for intersex conditions. This is, this is actually sort of a more accurate depiction of intersex conditions, okay? Intersex conditions apply to maybe one in 5,000 individuals, and intersex is really an umbrella term for uh, people who are born with ambiguous uh, genitalia, sort of they look sexually ambiguous at birth, or there's sort of a mismatch between their uh, external sexual phenotype, how they appear, and their internal uh, sexual anatomy. Um, but even if we zoom in on this little white square in the middle that represents these intersex individuals, almost the vast majority of these can be just on, you know, a little bit more investigation can be placed into the male or female side as well. Um, so, yeah, this, is, this, this argument really conflates um, two statements. So the, the idea that, um, you know, there's only two sexes or something. Hold on here. So there's this idea, so a claim that I would make, and I think a lot of people would make is there are only two sexes. This is really taken by a lot of activists to mean that we're saying that every single human being who ever existed and ever will exist can be un unambiguously categorized as to either male or female. So I actually leave the door open to this. I don't think we need to assert that every single individual necessarily has to be categorized. Maybe there's some individual through some developmental process could be super sexually ambiguous that doesn't even matter for the argument that there's only two sexes to survive, okay? Like, just because someone might be sexually ambiguous doesn't call in uh, everyone else's sex or mean that we're all sexually ambiguous to some degree. Okay, so a lot of people, even people I agree with on a lot of things will tend to say that like, you know, everyone can be categorized as male and female. Maybe they can, but that's actually not necessary for us to say that sex is still binary. Um, an individual with an ambiguous sex, there's still not a third sex, okay? Because male and female, uh, they refer to this different things. There's no like third type of reproductive anatomy to be organized around, a uh, third type of gamete. Uh, so as I said, just because sex may be ambiguous for some does not mean it's somewhat ambiguous, and as some activists might extrapolate, arbitrary for all. So I like to uh, sort of highlight this using an analogy of like a coin flip. 
So we use a coin flip to randomize a binary decision because a coin has only two faces. Uh, but a coin also has an edge, okay? And about one in 6,000 uh, throws, this is done with a nickel, will land on this edge. This is actually roughly the same likelihood of being born with an intersex condition, um, which is one in 5,000. Almost every coin flip will be either heads or tails, and those heads or tails don't come in degrees or mixtures. That's because heads and tails, these are you know, qualitatively different and mutually exclusive outcomes. Uh, the existence of edge cases does not change the fact, okay? Heads and tails, despite the existence of this edge, you know, they're, they're these discrete outcomes, okay? Uh, likewise, the outcomes of sexual development are almost always completely unambiguously 100% male and female. Uh, just because there might be some edge cases out there doesn't mean that we come in degrees, okay? Almost everyone is still 100% male and female, um, and I think the coin flip helps sort of uh, highlight that a little bit. And so this really comes into to play when you have a lot of people who are arguing for, say, like inclusion of someone like Leah Thomas in, into sports. A lot of times you'll get people making, like these activists making the arguments um, from intersex conditions. They'll say, you know, I'll say Leah Thomas shouldn't compete in, in female sports because Leah Thomas is biologically male. They'll say, well, sex is a spectrum. I'll say, well, what makes you say that? Well, intersex conditions are real. Okay, is Leah Thomas intersex? No okay, well then that doesn't really work, you know? Um, what, what Leah Thomas is essentially is, is heads identifying as a tails. This is not an edge case, you know, this is, this is an unambiguous case that um, I think really can be dismissed on, on the grounds of the intersex argument. They're, they're sort of grasping at straws when they're using this one to, to assert that the sex spectrum somehow means that you can identify anywhere else on the spectrum you'd like to. So now let's look at the secondary sex characteristics argument. Okay, so as I mentioned, secondary sex characteristics, these are anatomies that differentiate during puberty. So enlarged breasts, wider hips in females, facial hair, deeper voices, more musculature, broader shoulders in males. Um, because the so the argument sort of goes, because the distribution of these secondary sex characteristics can overlap between males and females, uh, it is argued that we should therefore view biological sex itself on a continuum. So there's a lot of organizations that will make this claim. Um, one that I like to really highlight, because it just spells it out so clearly, is the genderbred person. This is something that's used in a lot of grade schools in the, across the US, in Canada. I've even had people who are going to college send this to me. This is what they're using to get their, I guess, anatomy education as well as learning about gender identity and stuff. Um, I particularly want to zoom in on what it says about biological sex here, because I think it really just shows what we're up against and the confusion about what biological sex is. So. Um, so with biological sex, we have this really interesting thing here. We have uh, two, <laughs> two sort of lines that are going from, from nothing to femaleness and from nothing to maleness. And we're told that you, know, you can exist somewhere on here. Then when we look at the traits that they're using to describe whether you know, someone's degree of maleness or femaleness, we see things like body shape, voice pitch, body hair, and hormones. So presumably if you're a female, but you have a really deep voice, you know, you're kind of getting a little mannish, you know, literally in a sense. They would say that you're more male because you have a deeper voice or you're hairier or something like that. And a, and a male who has a high-pitched voice, uh, relatively small amounts of body hair, they would be literally more female. This is, this is, what, this is what they claim. This is a really popular uh, educational tool. Um, I would say, you know, conspicuously absent from this chart is any mention of gametes or sexual anatomy. Um, this, this isn't science when p kids are getting taught this. You know, this is, this is just like complete pseudoscience. It's not education. This is really indoctrination in like the highest degree. It's, it's pretty, pretty abhorrent. Um, so to understand why secondary sex characteristics don't define the sex, I'll, I'll sort of use an analogy that I've developed with uh, bikers and cyclists. So bear with me on this one here. <laughs> so, um, so on the left here we have bikers and then we have cyclists on the right. So bikers ride motorcycles and cyclists ride bicycles, okay? While these two vehicles may share many similarities, they differ in at least one fundamental way. Uh, motorcycles are powered by the engines, uh, by engines and fuel, while bi bicycles are powered uh, by pedaling legs, okay? 
Whether someone is a biker or a cyclist depends entirely on the binary criterion of whether they are riding a motorcycle or a bicycle. This is, we can call this the primary uh, characteristic that defines bikers and cyclists. But there are also many secondary characteristics associated with bikers and cyclists. You know, bikers, for instance, uh, might be more likely to wear leather jackets and jeans and wear bandanas, maybe even tattoos and things like that. While cyclists are more likely to wear these skin-tight spandex uh, suits to be more streamlined. Uh, bikers wear heavy helmets that contain the entire head and include the face shield, whereas cyclists typically wear lighter weight helmets uh, that cover only the tops of their heads. So many of these secondary sex characteristics of bikers and cyclists, you know, these aren't arbitrary or coincidental. Um, like the male and female secondary sex characteristics, we can, we can really just map the utility of biker and cyclist secondary characteristics to their primary characteristics. But importantly, a person who's riding a motorcycle, <laughs> who's wearing a spandex suit and lighter helmet, you know, they don't become a cyclist or less of a biker because they share some of these secondary characteristics uh, that are commonly associated with cyclists. So we might look at this person here and say this person looks like they ride a, a bicycle, but if they're on a motorcycle, you know, they're a biker. Okay, the primary characteristic is whether they're riding a motorcycle or a bike. Uh, and likewise, you know, a person riding a bicycle uh, wearing jeans and a leather jacket doesn't become a biker or less of a cyclist by sharing these secondary traits that are more typical of bikers. Uh, just as these secondary traits don't define bikers and cyclists, secondary sex characteristics don't define males and females. What defines males and females is their primary sex organs or their ovaries or their testes. So this is sort of a way to distinguish between primary and secondary characteristics, okay? So when any activist tries to tell you that you know, there's overlap in some of these secondary characteristics and that this determines whether you're male or female, that's just sort of a major misunderstanding of what, what it means to be male and female at a, you know, primarily at a fundamental level. So there's this idea that sex is bimodal. This is another, it's, it's, it's still within the family of sex spectrum arguments um, that secondary sex characteristics uh, give rise to this, you know, the, so, sorry, the argument that secondary sex characteristics define sex kind of gives rise to the bimodal spectrum argument. Um, this was made, I think, popular first by this person on Twitter named Science Vet, where they claim that sex is, is a spectrum or it's bimodal, and they kind of presented a graph like this. Uh, I kind of made it look a little better because it looked pretty bad. Um, so you can see why this sort of would prove popular because it accords with our intuitive sense that most of us cluster around males and females. Um, presumably you could take various measurements to find out where you align on this, on this graphic. Um, you know, it sounds really progressive in theory, but the consequences are really regressive and harmful in practice. So I'll highlight why. This should make it pretty clear. So is male A uh, more male than male B? <laughs> is female D more female than female C in this? Uh, for decades, we've properly taught our children that this kind of logic is you know, both insulting and toxic, you know, that a girl with more typically masculine features, we, we tell them that they're just as much of a girl as you know, their friend with maybe more stereotypically feminine physique. So we don't really know what a lot of the activists are even asserting is on the x-axis in these graphs, um, but whether it's you know, quantifying genital morphology or a combination of secondary sex traits and behaviors, the implication is that you know, a tall, aggressive males with thick beards, deep voices, larger penises, and higher testosterone are somehow more male than short males uh, with meeker personalities who answer to the opposite uh, description. And likewise, according to this uh, you know, sex spectrum chart, females with larger breasts and more stereotypically feminine waist to hip ratios, uh, less body hair would be considered more female than small breasted, less curvy and hairier females. This is literally sort of what pops out of a graph like this. If you just take it completely literally. Um, it, it is shockingly similar to what I think is what we maybe would, would classify as like playground bully logic. You know, there's a lot of kids, if they're not maximally masculine, you know, little boys, they get, they get teased. If you have a little boy who doesn't, maybe they don't, they don't have their beard growing in, they're very effeminate, they have a high voice, you know, they're gonna get bullied. They're gonna be called, you know, the people might say, what are you, a girl? Now, if they were to then go to a, the counselor or something or someone on their campus to try to resolve this, this bullying, and they say, oh, the, all, the, all the kids are bullying me, they're calling me a, a little girl, well, then the teacher might go to their sex spectrum diagram, look at it, and just be like, 
maybe you are a girl. <laughs> like, they're onto something here. So I think this is just a toxic way to look at it. This is it's a really bad implication of it. They, even if we just like give them the argument that sex is a bimodal spectrum, which we shouldn't, uh, the implications are just really regressive in practice. You know, w when we see a bimodal spectrum, because um, a lot of traits, secondary sex characteristics of humans do follow like a bimodal d distribution, um, but it's just because th there's two different sexes. Uh, and you know, if we take one of the women here that's furthest to the right on the, the height, uh, they can be taller than most men. They're still 100% female. They're not suddenly more of a male because they're just maybe male typical in height or something like that. So that's just a really important point I think we need to take away here. So then there's the other sort of argument, the other myth that there's more than two sexes. Um, this was, you know, um, Anne Fosto Sterling in the New York Times before, you know, so you should, biologically speaking, there's, uh, there are many gradations running from male to female. Along that spectrum lie at least five sexes, perhaps even more. Uh, she wrote other papers and I think a book as well, uh, arguing these. Uh, this is also, you can see, argued on YouTube. Um, you know, this one says that biological sex is a spectrum and that there are more than two sexes uh, in, the, in the description. Um, and then this person on Twitter, this, they got like 4,000 retweets. This is Dr. Shay uh, uh, Akil McLean, B-A-B-A-M-A-M-A-P-H-D. Um, they said that there's, they're responding to my friend Zach Elliott who was saying that you know, there's only two sexes in humans and this person, uh, MAMA PhD person said that, um, oh, actually, <laughs> humans, there's six common uh, sex karyotypes and there's four rarer ones. So presumably they're saying there's 10 sexes out there. Um, there's actually, they, they missed one. So if we, if we put all the ones at least that I know about, there's about 11. Um, and so the claim that they're making here is that all of these different ways to have your sex chromosomes arranged, you know, we see XX and XY, that's maybe what we would consider you know, normal male and female sex chromosomes. What they're saying is that every other variation outside this isn't variation within a sex. This is, this is these are brand new sexes, okay? These are, these are beyond males and females. Um, so 11 sexes, that's, that's quite a claim. You know, extraordinary claims are, require extraordinary evidence. But if we actually understand what a male and female are based on their reproductive anatomy, you know, we can actually reclassify these quite easily as just Female, male, female, male, 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 female, female, male, male. Uh, this, there's this idea that sex chromosomes define one sex. You'll say that, you'll read articles that say something like, you know, we've all been taught in school that, that sex chromosomes, you know, whether you have a XX or XY defines whether you're a male or female. But this is, this is actually not what we're taught. There's this, there's this distinguish between sex being determined by chromosomes and then sex being defined by chromosomes. So when, when a biologist says something like uh, your sex is determined by your sex chromosomes, what they're really saying is that the genes on your, these certain chromosomes uh, you know, put tissues down this pathway that will eventually inevitably result in the development of being a male or female. Um, but they're still, your sex is still defined by your primary re reproductive anatomy that you have. Um, to make this point even clearer, like we knew what males and females were before we knew what sex chromosomes were. That has to be true. Otherwise, we couldn't say under the microscope when we discovered a, a Y chromosome, we couldn't have made the claim that, oh, this, this is associated with being male. Like, if, if we didn't know what sex was before, we would have just defined the Y chromosome as it. So we have to make, in order to make the correlation itself, we have to know that sex is something that exists apart from what chromosomes you happen to have, okay? And so I put this in there because, um, you know, there's plenty of species that don't even have chromosomal sex determination. So a lot of alligators, a lot of reptiles, for instance, their sex is, you know, determined by the temperature at which they're incubated at, okay? But that doesn't mean that an alligator who has developed at a certain temperature is the sex they are because they developed at that temperature. We still identify the fact that an alligator is male or female by the reproductive anatomy. We just notice, we make an observation that those who incubated above the certain temperature tend to develop into males, those below tend to develop into females. Again, we know, we know what sex was before all of this. So, <laughs> what is a woman? <laughs> uh, so, for one, a woman is an adult, or if we're speaking biologically, this is an organism that has reached sexual maturity. 
So in humans, you know, we, we have laws, and so we, uh, we would sort of define them illegally as, you know, the United States is someone who's 18 years old. So at least in the U.S., an adult is going to be someone who's at least 18. Uh, they need to be a human. They're a member of the species Homo sapiens. I think we're all fit that description. Uh, and then they need to be a female. They need to be an individual whose reproductive anatomy is organized around through development the production of large gametes. And again, whether or not they, they currently produce gametes, they did in the past, maybe they never will in the future, but it's, it just depends on that sort of, that, that design that they have, the, the design plan. And why does this matter? So this is what I get a lot from people. You know, why do you care? If you've anyone saw the What is a Woman documentary, why do you care so much? Um, well, one, you know, truth matters, I think is really important, but I was always interested in sort of being a communicator of science. So, and public trust in science is really important. If we want institutions we can believe in and trust in, we need to understand that the information they're giving us is free of bias, free of political affiliation whatsoever. And if, if we're, <laughs> If, if we're getting, if scientists are out there getting like this low-hanging fruit of what a male and female is just completely wrong, that's obvious to anyone who's watching it, even young children, they understand that what males and females are. How can you possibly trust someone who's also talking about more complex models? Like we just came through a pandemic. How are you going to trust people about virology or epidemiology or climate science, which is using, you know, huge data sets and chaos models and stuff that is much more, like so many orders of magnitude more complex than just identifying someone's sex based on their reproductive anatomy. Um, if we can't just get this right, I mean, this is why I named my website Reality's Last Stand, because if we, just, if we can't make this basic observation about what's true, this is like the easiest thing. We should, this is like the underhanded pitch. It's, it's on a tee for scientists just to knock it out of the park. Um, and if we're not hitting it, then I don't know who we can trust <laughs> in science anymore, to be honest. Um, and, you know, also it matters because sex matters in certain contexts, certainly not all contexts, certainly not even most contexts. If you're going to get a raise, that shouldn't, your sex shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter if you decide someone to be your friend. Like this, there's so many contexts where sex really doesn't matter at all. It's only a, a very minority of contexts where it does, and it's usually just when sexual dimorphism happens to matter. And those contexts are, you know, things like women's sports or women's protected spaces like prisons and bathrooms like that. And this, this really just emerges because of the sexual dimorphism and you know, one sex has much more uh, you know, a threat of violence from the other than the other way around. So um, this is why this matters. And then something we didn't even really get into here that I'm not even gonna dive into, but um, I do elsewhere, is you know, this, things like the gender-bred person, these confuse children very much about what it means to be a male or a female or a boy and a girl. It confuses them, their relationship between their minds and their bodies. It teaches them to identify themselves with stereotypes that we should be telling them to just reject completely and just, you know, you can be masculine and you can be a girl, you can be feminine, you can be a boy. Um, and in worst case scenarios, you know, we have things like puberty blockers being introduced, putting kids down these paths of, you know, as Abigail Schreier would say, irreversible damage. So I think this is, there are so many, <laughs> so many consequences from denying a fundamental aspect of, of our biology. You know, you can't just ignore something so fundamental and not expect there to be a lot of crazy things happening up, a lot of glitches in the matrix. And I would argue that things like Leah Thomas, males competing in female sports, these are the things you would expect to show up when you're denying really large fundamental aspects of human biology. So truth matters. <laughs> I think if, if you care about justice, social justice or whatever, you really need to care first and foremost you know, about what is true. This is, I think, a point that Carol made, made earlier. Um, so I'll just leave with a, a quote. This is by Thomas Sowell in his book, The Quest for Cosmic Justice. He said, there's only so much divergence between prevailing theories and intractable reality that society can survive. Yet theories of equality are unlikely to be re-examined or examined the first time when they provide a foundation for the heady feeling of being morally superior to a benighted society. So thank you so much. Oh, okay, thank you. So um, the experts that are putting forth the idea of uh, sex as a spectrum and whatnot, have you ever encountered some of these um, experts actually trying to debunk the, um, 
you know, the fact that there are two gametes. Do they have, even address that? Do they do they just just you know do they provide arguments against that, or do they just ignore it completely? In my experience, they they really ignore it completely. I mean, we saw on the the gender bread chart right there. It doesn't even mention anything about reproduction whatsoever. Like it, it just ignores the fundamental defining criteria of what it means to be male and female in favor of just sort of like these secondary sex characteristics, for instance. Um, you know, I've had people sort of mention, you know, that those that gametes are certainly a, an aspect of one sex, but they would insist that those are just sort of one part of many that kind of create this mosaic of what it means to be a male or a female. They would just put gametes alongside of like hormone levels or, you know, voice pitch apparently. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's nuts. So one of the things that I noticed right off is that you used the term sex exclusively and never used the term gender. Yes. And one of the things that's interesting, you know, because one of the things we've noticed is that they're co-opting terminology to, to their benefit. Is, is your use of sex here a reflection of the fact that gender identity or gender, that the, that the side of activism is really trying to co-opt the truth about what sex is and redefine sex into this category and get away from the use of the term gender or gender identity? Yeah, I mean, I would say they're trying to just blur them all together in a slurry. I mean, it used to be the case, I remember maybe around 2010, I had some friends, some progressive friends, and I was very much in that mindset too. We were asked to you know, distinguish between somebody's sex, which was biological, and the, their gender identity. And they said that we're gonna use the words male and female to refer to someone's sex, and we're gonna use man and woman to refer to someone's gender identity. And I think a lot of people went along with that, because we're like, okay, we have these two separate sets of terms, why not just have that be a thing? Um, and it was okay with me because as, as someone who was into biology, I said, well, as long as there's that wall between your identity and your biology, then okay, I, I, didn't, I can make a, I'll concede some ground right there, um, but promise you won't go any further. Uh, that took about, you know, just a, a minute for that to happen. Um, and, you know, I, I pointed out the book, you know, the, the spectrum of sex, when you're reading these things, they really just use sex and gender interchangeably. Or they'll might say one refers to one thing here, and you know, gender refers to this other thing. But then they'll just use them interchangeably throughout. So they're they're really, I mean, I would, I think it's really intentional at this point where they're just trying to sort of really confuse people about what sex is. They're trying to define it in terms of stereotypes. Um, from a, a biological point of view, I don't really have my like my own definition of what gender is. I just listen to what people are saying about what they think it is, and then I, I try to understand if, if that's conflicting with what I understand males and females to be. Um, I'll try to meet people where they're at if they have a certain definition. I'm usually willing to use, you know, for the, the sake of conversation, whatever definition they like, just so I can make sure we're arguing concepts rather than just throwing different sounding words at each other. Um, but they're really, yeah, they're, they're trying to blur the lines. That's, that's where the whole like queer theory comes in to just try to blur any sort of distinction that we can make. And it's increasingly difficult to even write on this topic because when you try to just write something, you write a word and then you, admit, you immediately realize that there's seven different ways that people are gonna read that word from depending on where on the, the ideological spectrum they're coming at. So it's, uh, they, they seize the language first and I think that's I think it's part of the broad tactic is if you don't have the words to even talk about males and females anymore, then they can sort of just kind of create their own, own, own reality. So, Colin, as a scientist, you know, an evolutionary biologist, um, are you seeing kind of the blurring of lines coming from other scientists, or is it like social scientists kind of infringing into your territory? I mean, when I'm not reading these articles, but you know, uh, media and whatnot, where are they, who, who, whose ear, to, who has their ear? Yeah, well, in my experience, it's coming from a lot of the younger scientists. So it is, I mean, it, it definitely started within like the humanities departments, but it's, it's everywhere. In my field, evolution and ecology, um, anyone who's my age or younger is completely taken over by that ideology. Um, my advisors, they were always on my side. They, they totally agreed with everything I said, but they, they don't think they can speak about it because they're, even though they have tenure, you know, they don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole because they have a lot of collaborators who, who, um, who believe these things. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the students. I'm not sure where they're getting it. I think it's just sort of broadly in the, in the culture. And so they're, they're getting it from somewhere, but they're bringing it into the labs with them, for sure. 
it's, it's a really big issue. I mean, I had a, a, someone that I went to grad school with. We shared a lab. We overlapped for four years. We were best friends for a while. Um, really reasonable person, the last person I would ever expect to be like taken over by an ideology like this. You know, they got a job at a major university, the University of Florida. A week later, pronouns went up in the bio. And then they're literally texting me saying that people are looking at the fact that we had co-authored papers together on spiders and wasps. That's what I studied when I was in academia. And their colleagues are questioning, like, you're co-authored with this, this super transphobic person. And they were just basically this, this policing of other scientists. And he said that it was getting so bad that he had to publicly sort of denounce me on Twitter. And I was just like, OK, you can do that if you want. I thought it was going to be like making arguments. But it was really just this complete distancing as they went through this like struggle session with people, basically. And then he didn't get everything completely right. So then he was taking flack for not being maximally woke and saying all the right words. Um, yeah, it's, it's this mutual policing that's going on in, in these departments. Um, it's, it's, it's really shocking to behold. OK, one more question, and then we need to move on. I was just curious if you could answer the question of how much of this do you think is potentially cynicism, and how much of it is true ideological commitment? Because I'm coming from academia, too, and obviously you're aware of how difficult going on the academic job market is. So it seems like it would give you an advantage to put pro pronouns in your bio, even if you don't believe that at all. And I know people who've done that precisely for that reason, to give them an edge in you know, DIE, and that it might also give you an edge to undermine competitors by pointing out their transphobia. So could you just talk about, do you see any of this as pure cynical self-interest? Yeah, I mean, my, my old PhD advisor, he's, he's very much... Uh, he, how do I say this the best way? He, he likes to climb ladders socially, um, and he, he very much and he was a he was a flamboyant gay man, and he very much just sort of rode the trans wave. I think when he applied to his university, he just put they them pronouns in there because no one's going to question this, you know, sort of flamboyant gay guy about their pronouns and stuff. And um, he put pronouns up all this stuff. I, and, I, and he even told me that he was doing this for that reason and they end up getting like this really big job in, at a Canadian university. So it, it works uh, for sure. Um, I think a lot of people, they might just do it just to stay under the radar. You know, they just put, put the pronouns up, just keep your head down, and they can just sort of weather the storm. Um, but there are a lot of true believers. I mean, I think my, my old colleagues, a lot of them anyway, um, I think they, they truly believe it now, or at least it's just easier to convince yourself that it's, there's a nugget of truth there and that it's not as bad as you think it is just because they have no choice when they're, when they're in this environment. They just, they have to sort of double down on this. It's the way you get grants, it's the way you uh, publish papers and get collaborations. So it's, it's hard to operate outside that, that system. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, thank you for your courage. <laughs> And I think we understand where the name reality's last stand comes from. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Wright.